For the church in Detroit, reliving the gospel mysteries means that we continually return to the upper room, asking for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on us and on the whole region. We seek to bring every member of the church, insofar as possible, into a personal and life-transforming experience of the Holy Spirit. Now, in that passage, there's three things that I want to drive in on. The first is that we continually return to the upper room. If we don't know what the first Pentecost looked like, we're not going to understand how we're supposed to act like the early church now. The second is every member of the church, insofar as possible, should be invited into a personal and life-transforming experience of the Holy Spirit. Before that can be done, we first need to understand who the Holy Spirit is, how he interacts with us, and what life in the Spirit truly looks like. And the third is a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on us and the whole region. Because once we know how the first Pentecost was, and once we know who the Holy Spirit is, we'll be able to live that reality right here and right now in this city, in our parishes, and in our families. So first of all, Pentecost, the first Pentecost. Now all of you have heard the Pentecost experience in the upper room, but it actually begins a lot earlier with the promise that Jesus makes regarding the power of the Father that will come upon the disciples for a mission. In the Gospel of Luke we read, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What is this power from on high that Jesus is talking about? Apparently, it's important enough that the apostles aren't even allowed to leave the city until they receive it. And the answer to what this power is comes from the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 16, at the very end of this Gospel, we read, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to the whole of creation. And these signs will accompany those who believe. So basically, go into the world and proclaim the Gospel, proclaim the good news. And then the second part is explaining why they need power. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now this is very important, because what Jesus is doing for them is he's saying, go out and proclaim the gospel of all creation, but he's not letting them go and do it on their own power. He is going to give them miraculous signs and wonders, casting out demons, speaking in tongues, all these various miracles that will give credence to the gospel that they are proclaiming because they will be able to preach the gospel and then show the people the power of the living Jesus Christ right here and right now. And that's exactly what we see happening in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit actually comes upon the 120 disciples the apostles, and Jesus' mother Mary in the upper room. We read, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the rush of a mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Immediately after receiving the Holy Spirit, this scared group of disciples who were hiding in the upper room are unleashed into the streets where they begin healing people, delivering people from demons, speaking in new tongues. And the force of this Holy Spirit power released in them, accompanied with the preaching of the gospel, leads to a mass conversion. We read that 3,000 souls were baptized in just one day. Why are we not seeing this fruit nowadays? Maybe some of you are thinking, well, this is just because that was for the past. But I beg to differ. And scripture begs to differ as well. 
Because in Galatians chapter uh, 13, sorry, chapter 3, verse 5, Paul is exhorting the entire church, not just the apostles, because he's writing to a church. He's not writing to his fellow apostles. He writes this. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And he's talking to an entire church who appears to be manifesting signs and wonders in their church community. Now the next objection you might be saying is, well, that was just for the early church. Okay, maybe it isn't just for the great saints, for the great apostles, but that was for the early church. That time is gone. <laughs> well, I want to know, why do we think that the same Holy Spirit that was inspiring this in the olden times, did he go away? Did he go back to heaven? No, he was breathed out now. He was breathed out for us today. And I can manifest that the power of God is alive and well and working in supernatural ways here in this city now. Um, last semester, I was uh, getting ready for bed and I got this image in my mind of an elderly black woman with a white hat on and gold earrings. Now this doesn't happen to me very often, but it happened then. And God said to me, you are going to meet this woman tomorrow and I want you to tell her something. And that was it, that's all he said, that's all he left me with. And I was a little scared, but I was like, all right, I'm gonna meet this woman tomorrow and I'm gonna talk with her. So the next day I was going to St. Augustine and Monica's parish, which I had never been to before. Does, is anyone here from that parish? No one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one, 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 <laughs> awesome. So I had never been to this church before. So as I'm walking up the sidewalk into the church, lo and behold, who do I see? But a parked car with this woman in the back seat. And uh, I kind of, I, you know when you start to bargain with God? When you're scared. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Lord, if, if you actually want me to talk to this woman, I'm pretty sure that's who it is, but maybe it was a different hat. or you know, maybe, I'm not sure. Make her come into the church and sit in front of me. Up the ante. So again, I shouldn't have been surprised, but while I'm sitting in the pew, who comes in and sits in front of me? So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go talk with her. But I still didn't know what I was supposed to say. I just knew I had to go talk with her. So I'm sitting there in front of the tabernacle, and I'm like, listen, Lord, I will go and talk to this woman, but you need to tell me what I'm supposed to say. And he said, tell her that she doesn't need to worry about her son anymore that I'm taking care of him. I said, okay. So I walked up to her. I knelt down beside her and I said, look, this is gonna sound very strange. Can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure. I said, I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you that you don't need to worry about your son anymore, that he's being taken care of. And she said, wow. I said, does that mean something to you? She said, yes, my son died this summer, and I've been very worried about him. Thank you so much. You've brought, you brought me a lot of peace today. And I was just blown away by how God is using ordinary Christians to bring about supernatural experiences of his love and of his mercy. Now, how, now I'm, not any, I'm not special. I'm not any holier than any of you. And what I want from this day is that all of you will be empowered in the same way to go out with the same spirit and bring Jesus to other people. But who is the Holy Spirit? Because we need to know who he is before we can start acting in The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. He is a true person, sometimes referred to as the forgotten third person of the Trinity, because Sometimes as Catholics, we don't know how to deal with the Holy Spirit. We know Jesus, we know the Father, but the Holy Spirit is kind of this mysterious dove in, in art. We don't really know what he does. His mission is to sanctify the church and to empower believers to spread the gospel. He is essential for the Christian life. Kelly was talking earlier about how we need to grow in our relationship as children of the Father. Well, let me tell you that this relationship with the Father is impossible without revelation from the Holy Spirit. We read in the book of Romans, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. We also can't even know the basic tenet of Christianity, which is that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us straight up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is who the person of the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit does other things as well. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He changes us from the sinners that we were into the sons of God that I mentioned. He increases our prayer life. He opens up the scriptures to us, comes to us in the sacraments. And brothers and sisters, if you have come here today experiencing dryness in your prayer time, or an aridity, a staleness, that you feel like you've plateaued in your spiritual life, your life will never be the same after today if you open up your heart to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Because He is going to do a work in you today that will change you completely. He's going to take your sinful past, that scripture up there, where it says you were immoral, idolaters, adulterers, the whole list of sins. Such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. He will transform your life so that you are not the sins you have committed, but you will be a new creation. You say, that's great, Isaac. This is wonderful. This sounds great. I want this. I hope you want this. But how do we receive it? We receive it through what's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple guys have mentioned the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and it's kind of become this buzzword. But what exactly is it? Well, I'm going to tell you straight up that it is not um, a second, another sacrament. It's not another baptism. You only have one of those. Sorry. But um, the, the, the thing with us Catholics is that, and you may be like, oh, he's pouring milk. This is very interesting. What is he going to be talking about baptism? Is it a baptism in milk? No, it is not. <laughs> what baptism does, when, when you were baptized, you were like this glass of milk. Before baptism, you were like this glass of milk. You had no Holy Spirit in you. And what the Holy Spirit is going to represent is this chocolate powder. <laughs> right? So, when you received baptism, the Holy Spirit was dumped into your life just like that. And so you can see that at baptism, yes, you're given the Holy Spirit. It's starting to mix a little bit. But it isn't completely a part of you. Because while it's in you, it's not being used to its full potential. And what baptism in the Holy Spirit does is it comes in and it stirs it up. It stirs all the gifts and the graces that you have received at your baptism so that you can start to use them. Because for many of us, especially as Catholics, we were baptized as infants. And so we didn't get the opportunity to use the gifts to start using the Holy Spirit right at our baptism. So that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. It's a, it's a grace that stirs up the gifts that you received already at the sacrament of baptism. It's the baptism that was prophesied by John the Baptist when he said he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now that sounds epic. That sounds like something I want. I want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But how do we receive this, Isaac, you may be asking? Well, let me tell you, it's very simple. We ask and the Father gives. <clears throat> That's all it is. Because at the end of the day, the Father wants to give himself to us way more than we want to receive him. We read in Luke, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We just need to ask, and he will pour it out in abundance. 
Now, what happens when we receive this baptism in the Holy Spirit? There's a bunch of different things that happen, or could happen, I should say. Like I said, all that was mentioned earlier, conviction of sins, repentance, increase in prayer life, knowledge of the Father and the Son happens. With some people, there's a physical sensation. Um, for example, some people feel a heat in their head, in their hands, or in their body. Some people feel a great, uh, a great peace coming over them, like they're sinking into water or floating. Some people shake or fall over because they're so overcome with the glory and the presence of God that they fall over or they shake. Their body represents what's happening in their soul. Sometimes people don't feel anything. And it's important that when receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, like you will be in a few minutes, you don't look around at what other people are doing, but you notice what God is doing in you, personally. When I was baptized in the Spirit, I was actually at my confirmation in grade 7. And I was lined up with all the other grade sevens in our red robes. And when the bishop made the sign of the cross on my forehead and said, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, I was ready. I was hungry for more of God. And I felt like there was a burning cross on my forehead. And I was filled with such joy that I laughed at jokes that weren't funny. I told jokes that weren't funny. <laughs> uh, pictures of me from that day, I look flushed in the face, and I have this big sloppy grin on me. And there's no way my parents would have let me drink at that age, so trust me, that was not what was happening. But I was in that, essentially, I felt a little drunk, a little drunk in the Holy Spirit. That's how much joy I was feeling. There's also the giving of gifts, charisms of the Holy Spirit that happen. In 1 Corinthians, we get a list of not all of these gifts, because the Holy Spirit is infinite, infinite, and can always give more. But we get a list of some of them, and I don't have time to go into all of them. But I will tell you my testimony receiving one of these gifts. And it's probably the one that freaks people out the most. Can anyone guess what that one is? Tongues. Tongues. Exactly. You guys can read my mind. So the gift of tongues has been given a lot of, there's been a lot of confusion surrounding this particular gift. And instead of launching into a teaching about tongues, because I just don't have time for that, instead I'm just going to tell you what happened to me. Now I am not a person who thinks very highly of people who fake spiritual phenomenon for attention. Something that I just cannot stand. And so when I was asking for this gift of tongues, I told the Lord, Sometimes I can be very harsh with the Lord. I said, Lord, you need to make this very clear because I don't want to fake this. And I was at a Steubenville conference. And someone had told me in the context of adoration that there was people that I needed to forgive in my life. And I had been harboring hate and resentment towards people that had hurt me in my past. And as the monstrance was there before me and praise and worship music was playing, I surrendered all of these people to the Lord. And I felt this great burden, this great weight being lifted off. And then I began to praise God in English, out loud. You know, Lord, you're awesome, you're amazing, thank you for my baptism, thank you for saving me, you are such a good God. And then I wasn't speaking English anymore. I was speaking in what is now known as well, it's known as, as prayer tongues. It just sounds like a string of consonants and, and vowels put together. And with the companions of the cross, if you haven't noticed already, we're a bit of a charismatic community. And so I've been able to practice this gift because it's like a language, something that you learn. The moral of all of this is don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of Archbishop Vigneron calls in his letter for a radical openness to the leading of the Spirit. A radical openness. And so what I'm asking you to do, brothers and sisters, is to lay down your previous conceptions and structures that you have thought about God. Because I can tell you right now that God is going to blow all of those expectations. And if you give him permission, if you open up your life to him, he is going to take you to places that you never thought you would go. 
So are you ready for this? Are you excited for this? Yes. Because in a few minutes, you are going to be empowered with the same spirit that was filling the apostles when they went out to the streets with boldness to proclaim the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to be filled with that same spirit. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do with you and how he's going to lead you as you leave this talk.